I, I, in the time that I have uh, allocated this morning, I'm going to try and walk you through the, the concepts that are involved, value-added tax, um, try to situate this discussion a little bit broader in the context of getting the government uh, financial house in order, because that is very important, notwithstanding the fact that we're looking at value-added tax. And then, uh, before I conclude, talk a little bit about the design element of this, this framework, which are essential if it's going to work and deliver upon the revenue that we're hoping to, because you know there has been some chatter in terms of the potential net loss in revenue from this, as well as the economic impact. And uh, what I will share with you uh, some of the design features which, which speak to those issues, drawing on international experience. But very quickly, the value-added tax, or the VAT, is part of an overall reform in government finances um, and fiscal framework. It's largely a replacement tax for customs duties and excise taxes. So on July 1st, 2014, the intention is that we're looking at reductions in customs duties and excise taxes in the 15 to 20 percent range in order to make way for, for that. There may be some exceptions for, for the industries and sectors where the government already has protective tariffs in place uh, for, for some industries. So th th those will be respected in terms of preserving the protection, but generally speaking, the 15 to 20 percent range is what we're looking at in terms of what sort of reduction would be needed in customs, duties, and excise taxes. Well, where the government is going to gain is that now it's shifting its attention to the services sector to collect more revenue. In addition, it has now introduced a mechanism that is going to improve upon tax compliance relative to the present system. And so therefore, there is there's also some improvement in revenue intake because of better compliance. What will happen, really, on this documentation trail, we will have better evidence on whether the declarations that are made to customs are honest. Because if they're, they're not honest, it means that, in many cases, the consumers are paying high prices under the pretense that they are reimbursing businesses for customs duties, which is not the case. So if you can strip that away in many cases, what will happen in the end is that the government will be collecting the taxes and the consumer in many cases will be paying prices close to what they are paying but a little bit more confidence in terms of how that total price was distributed between the government and the merchant. So, so the compliance element is also important in terms of looking at the, the net yield. Going further, I mean, part of the reform too is three, four years out, two years out, looking at how the gains that the government realizes because of this tax system can translate into changes elsewhere in the, in the tax system in terms of the rates of taxation on other activities so, so that again you have even more rebalancing and opportunity to, 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 to give back. As a business, what it will do when you're selling lots of goods, the fact that that value-added tax component in your inventory cost is quickly reversed through this filing process. It should contribute positively to your working capital needs. When you buy your goods today and you pay 30% customs duties, and you take three months before you sell it to even realize um, some revenue back to finally recover the amount you paid in customs duty. Now, Let's suppose you brought in, say, $10,000 worth of goods and you had to come up with 4000 With a VAT, now you had to come up with maybe 2000 in customs duties and 2000 for value-added tax. Of course, the arithmetic is off here. The 2000 that you paid in customs in value-added tax, the first month that you file your returns with the government, you get a credit for that. Most of what we consume is imported. So if you look at furniture as an example, when you bring furniture in, say if you have a, if you have a furniture store, 
um, you will pay the value added tax to customs. So that customs will be the first um, line in, in terms of the tax collection. So just as they collect uh, import duties and excise taxes, they will collect the VAT. Now the next stage now is that because you've already paid this amount of VAT at the border, you're going to keep a record of VAT. Imagine now you're, you're selling the furniture to, the, to your customer, an end customer. That customer will be charged a value-added tax. Now the government is going to gain a little bit of extra revenue because the business is going to base its selling price on a level of revenue that will cover its operating costs. And therefore, that extra between the price at the customs and the price that the final um, customer pays allows the government to, to recoup an additional amount of revenue. What the business will do now is it will look at the total amount of tax that has been taken in from the consumer and take the credit for the amount that was already paid to customs. Hence, um, the government in this exercise only gets the amount of tax that is paid in the final stage, even though it's collecting it in successive stages of the transaction. Now, another example, the food business. You have an importer, um, they bring in goods wholesale, uh, they pay the customs duty, they pay the VAT, they, they sell it to a restauranter who converts it into a meal. Um, again, VAT is paid, VAT is collected, the restauranter uh, sells the meal, collects 15% VAT from the customer. Now, both the restauranter and the importer are now involved in this chain of transactions, and they will both be making uh, submissions to the government for the net amount of VAT that they have to, to provide to the government after taking the credit for any VAT that they would have paid. So the wholesales, wholesaler paid some VAT to customs. He collected some VAT from the restauranter for the inputs that went into the meal uh, before he passed it along to the, the government, which is happening on a monthly basis. He reminds himself that he's already paid some of that VAT, very important, and he takes that amount out of the total that he remits to the government. The restauranter is in the same situation after he has collected or she has collected the amount of value added tax from their customers, he will be reminded that he's already paid some VAT to the wholesaler, plus he will have his documentation or his, his VAT credit receipts to show that he paid this amount of VAT, and he will make the deduction and submit it to the Central Revenue Agency. We're not asking him to submit any other documentation, just tell us how much VAT you paid, how much you collected, and please submit it electronically because we're not asking you to submit it uh, in paper form. In this process, you have an audit trail which helps with compliance. Every time a business sells and gives a VAT credit receipt, they are putting evidence out there on the amount of activity that is being generated within the business. That sort of documentation trail does not exist today. We only have customs. Now we will have customs and we will have all of the, the documentation from the transaction that take place in between. That is very important in terms of whether VAT will improve upon the culture of tax compliance. I mean, ask yourself, if you had to under-report on your sales, say, for your business license tax, we have to take your word for it unless we go in and we audit your business. But if you had to under-report your sales under a value-added tax, we don't have to take your word for it because if you're a wholesaler, there are countless retailers who have receipts which you issued as evidence of how much sales you have made. And the question then becomes, is there going to be a greater or a lesser temptation for someone to under-report, knowing that there is all of this evidence out there of their business activity? That is very important if we're going to talk about whether this system is going to be effective in terms of compliance. And quite frankly, it encourages more self-compliance, and that's very important. You, you do not get that with a sales tax because there is no evidence trail. Now, 
very important to understand with, with value added tax, we, some of the concepts, only some businesses will be involved in this transaction chain. These are called the VAT registrants. And the proposal is that any business that has sales on an annual basis of at least $100,000, sales that will be subject to value added tax, they will be registered, meaning that they can charge the value added tax to their customers and they can collect, they, they can receive credit for the VAT on their inputs and they can do this reporting on, on, a, on a monthly basis doing the, the, the relevant netting out. If your business falls below the threshold, you would not be required to register. And not being required to register for that also means that you do not automatically present yourself to get credit for the VAT that you paid on the inputs that went into your business. So if you're in this category, any item that you sell would be considered exempt for value-added tax purposes. Well, what it means now is that as a small business, you recover the value-added tax that you paid on your inputs uh, by passing it along indirectly in the price to the consumers. Now, the concern in this is that the consumer is paying a tax, but the consumer is paying a tax today. The consumer is paying that tax indirectly in most cases. What we're doing with this reform is we're allowing you to see, in most cases, what the amount of the taxes are that you're paying that are going to the government. So the process isn't suddenly about um, manufacturing this huge new amount of taxes that consumers are paying. It is now providing a bit more transparency in terms of the taxes that are being paid. So that is very important to, to understand in, in this process. The difference between what will be and what is, is that in many cases, a consumer who pays, say, $15 for an item today, the $15 stays within the business. The entire $15 stays within the business, and the business uses some of that to recover whatever customs duty costs were incurred on the goods that were sold. July 1st, 2014 and afterwards, out of that $15, the consumer still pays it, but now the business has to take somewhere between maybe one to two dollars out of that 15 and pass it along to the government. So that's an amount that is no longer a cost for the business. It's, it's an amount that is recognized as due to the government when the transaction occurred. So that, that's very important. And what it also means though is that after July 1st, when you look at the price of an item on the shelf, that price will be quoted to you before the value added tax is put on the good. So you still have the option of shopping in Miami and bringing in your goods. You'll pay the VAT at customs, true. But now you can look at that price on the shelf and determine whether the business has made any allowances for the, the reduction in customs duties and whether that cost, that custom duty reduction is now reflected in the price that the business is charging to you. It should be, and if custom duties are lower, the price that you see on the shelf will be lower before you pay the VAT. It's another issue though, as a consumer, you will be concerned not about what the price is before you pay the VAT, but what the price is after you've paid the VAT. And that is the focus of the, the research that the government is doing right now. And we will share with you soon to give you an indication of what those final prices will be. Now, in terms of that and the concepts that are involved, there we talk about sales at a standard rate. In the case of the Bahamas, we're looking at a 15% value added tax. Um, we talk about sales at a zero rate. It means that if you're charging that, even if it's zero percent, you get to claim the credits or the refunds. The question is who gets to charge the zero rate for value added tax? If you are a, an exporter of fisheries products or any kind of export, we say 
you can, you can tax those exports at a zero rate, meaning you do not collect any VAT from your, 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 your customers. But because you're charging this zero rate, we give you all the VAT credits, which means that if you're in the export sector, the value added tax as, uh, as a tax is completely removed from your operation, and that is by design because the value added tax is only supposed to be focused upon collecting revenues for goods and services that are consumed inside the Bahamas or inside the, the borders of a country. And so, so for this way, you, you, you have a mechanism so that it does not impact import, exports. We also have the category of exempt sales, meaning that there is no VAT charge at the point of sales. However, businesses that would be selling products that are exempt may have incurred some value added tax on their purchases and other services that go into their operation. But because they're selling exempt products and services, they are not entitled to claim value added tax credits on, on those exempt sales. So you could also have a case though that a business, say if you're a grocery store, there are some items that you're selling that may have VAT attached to it, and there are other items that may be exempt, many uh, basic food items. So when you look at that, that, that establishment and you try to determine whether they're gonna get any credits for the value added tax they paid on their inputs, you just take whatever the percentage of their sales are that is that attracted VAT, from their total sales, and you provide that same fraction in terms of the total amount of credits or offsets that they would be able to take. So, so in those cases, when you start to dig deeper, you will see the sort of um, prorating, so to speak, in terms of how credits would be provided back to businesses. And that's very important to, to, to understand. Now, again, the system will be designed to be more transparent in terms of consumers seeing a lot more in terms of what taxes the government is collecting, what they're paying compared to where we are today. Um, businesses that charge value added tax, they will have to issue receipts that show the amount of VAT that is charged. If you do not do that, then it becomes a criminal penalty, meaning that there are fines plus uh, possibility of uh, prison sentences attached. I mean, this will come out when you see the, the draft legislation. If a business tries to charge the VAT explicitly and they're not registered, meaning that they're not authorized to do so, again, they expose themselves to the possibility of criminal fines and penalties for doing such. So it's a case where the buyer has to be aware of what's going on and make certain you'll be able to go online and check to see whether the business is indeed registered to charge the VAT. And if you uh, want to rely on the physical doc evidence, when you go into the establishment, uh, you'll be able to look on the wall the same way you do for business license and see the, the VAT certificate. But maybe you'll doubt that is legitimate. So in a case like that, you can very quickly check the government's database and get, get that assurance that you are indeed paying this tax to someone who is going to pass it along to the government. If you're in this chain, it also means now, in terms of businesses, you have to improve, in some cases, your record keeping so that you can keep track of what is being paid or collected for value added tax. Again, in most cases, this charge does not accumulate in your business as a cost, so it is not supposed to influence your markup on your goods. These are the kinds of issues that we will go through when we have the workshops with, with, with the, the registrants for, uh, that will be a part of the, the, VAT, the VAT chain. Now, let's digress a little bit. We're talking about VAT, but the real issue here is about a reform of the, the fiscal system, the government finances, 
And why is this happening? We're, we're looking at modernizing our tax system to be more consistent with the modern realities of the country. Um, 20, 30 years ago, the Bahamas could care less about participating in trade agreements because they focused mostly on goods. We imported goods, it didn't matter. But now, trade liberalization focuses on issues related to investments. You know, we live and die by foreign investments. If you're not a part of those trade agreements, you don't have the best arrangements in terms of the rules that govern foreign investment. Services are very important. Tourism, financial services and the like, your professional services, your lawyers and your accountants. These are all areas that are impacted by trade agreements, the World Trade Organization. So it makes sense for the Bahamas to be a part of these and in becoming a, a member of these, 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 these groupings, um, it is incumbent upon us to, to look at our tax structure for goods. And so if you're going to reduce your customs tariffs on imports, you have to find a substitute revenue source. So you need the value added tax. This reality may not hit the Bahamas hard and fast for a number of years to come because even when the Bahamas decides to commit in terms of what the customs duty structure will look for its trading partners, it will not have to deliver upon that structure immediately. But the preparation for that delivery is important. The other thing that is even more critical, well I shouldn't say more critical, but just as critical is the fact that we have a very narrow tax base. It is unequitable in the sense that we're taxing considerably on goods. The lower your income, the greater share of your income is spent on goods. So we need to broaden the tax base, make it more equitable, tax more services, or, and in doing so, you're also taxing activities in your economy so that when, they, when the economy grows, the government revenue grows more in sync with the growth in the economy. If that does not happen, we could balance the government's budget tomorrow by increasing customs duties. But I guarantee you, five years out, the government would be facing the same problems again because it will be overlooking so many other activities that are increasing probably faster than our consumption of goods and the government would fall behind. So it is important for the government to anchor its revenue growth. Let's digress a little bit. We're talking about that, but the real issue here is about a reform of the, the fiscal system, the government finances, and why is this happening? We're, we're looking at modernizing our tax system to be more consistent with the modern realities of the country. Um, 20, 30 years ago, the Bahamas could care less about participating in trade agreements because they focused mostly on goods. We imported goods, it didn't matter. But now, trade liberalization focuses on issues related to investments. You know, we live and die by foreign investments. If you're not a part of those trade agreements, you don't have the best arrangements in terms of the rules that govern foreign investments. Services are very important. Tourism, financial services and the like, your professional services, your lawyers and your accountants. These are all areas that are impacted by trade agreements, the World Trade Organization. So it makes sense for the Bahamas to be a part of these and in becoming a, a member of these, 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 these groupings, um, it is incumbent upon us to, to look at our tax structure for goods. And so if you're going to reduce your customs tariffs on imports, you have to find a substitute revenue source. So you need the value added tax. This reality may not hit the Bahamas hard and fast for a number of years to come because even when the Bahamas decides to commit in terms of what the customs duty structure will look for its trading partners, it will not have to deliver upon that structure immediately. But the preparation for that delivery is important. The other thing that is even more critical well, I shouldn't say more critical, but just as critical, is the fact that we have a very narrow tax base. It is unequitable in the sense that we're taxing considerably on goods. The lower your income, the greater share of your income is spent on goods. So we need to broaden the tax base, make it more equitable, tax more services, 
or, and in doing so, you're also taxing activities in your economy so that when, they, when the economy grows, the government revenue grows more in sync with the growth in the economy. If that does not happen, we could balance the government budget tomorrow by increasing customs duties. But I guarantee you, five years out, the government would be facing the same problems again because it will be overlooking so many other activities that are increasing probably faster than our consumption of goods, and the government would fall behind. So it is important for the government to anchor its revenue growth. Also, and I, I will talk on this briefly, the, 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 the volume of government services need to measure up a lot more to the average level of income in, in our country. The Bahamas is classified as a high-income country. Um, and if you look at high-income countries and you look at the quality of government services, um, you will find that in many cases they are lacking in the Bahamas in the sense that there isn't sufficient resources for the government to do that. It does not negate the argument that there is room for more efficiency in the way government spends and to find savings. But, but even there, one needs to look at it very carefully in terms of, of how you approach it in the short term. The fiscal reality is that we have rising debt. Um, if nothing is done to arrest it, we will run into problems in the future. It's not a problem today, and because it is not a problem today, it may be um, very easy to try and ignore it. But if you do so, you do so at your own detriment, and you do so at a higher cost of making the correction future, looking at the same sort of measures that the government is contemplating now. You will be looking at higher levels of taxes to correct for the imbalance, and you would be looking at more difficult decisions in terms of cutting spending, including jobs, which to some extent you may be able to skirt away from now because you're not quite in that desperate situation. Now, the reason why the debt has been increasing is because the revenues are not matching up to expenditures. From time to time, the government goes in and it tweaks customs duties and the like, and it shortens the gap a bit. But if you look, if you look at this chart and the, the bars, they show the growth in the debt from in the last decade. And you see debt as the percentage of GDP. Um, this goes up to 2012. But if you've been following the government finances, we're approaching 60% um, in terms of the government's um, debt as the percentage of GDP. And what it means is that more of the government's resources have to go into paying interest costs, paying interest on the debt, more than $200 million on a yearly basis. Now, imagine what you could do with $200 million um, if, if you could channel it into government expenditures on education, uh, on health, or in fighting crime, or even directly tackling poverty. You don't have as much luxury to do this because with all governments, paying your debt comes first. That's the last thing in many cases that governments tend to let slide before um, you know, the, the fiscal house collapses. Now, and it goes to the point that I was making, if we don't if you don't bridge the gap between revenue and expenditures, eventually you will run into that roadblock and you will have to make the same tough decisions, make, taking even more drastic measures than, than, than the government is looking at now. So that is very important to, to understand. Now, do we cut spending or do we raise taxes? If you're in the private sector, the, the knee-jerk reaction would be say, slash the size of the public sector right now. I mean, why should I worry about the government getting more revenues? Um, but one third, only a third of the government's total spending is on salaries. That's about, I think, close to $25 million a month. More than half of the civil servant salaries go into deductions. Now the question is, who receive those deductions? The private sector, banks, more than half, those are loans, mortgages, 
remember that when you talk about fiscal adjustment and how you do it. Um, I'm not saying that the adjustment should not be done, but remember that there is no easy path to fiscal adjustment and to think that you can do it only by cutting expenditures, you're kidding yourself in terms of the impact on the economy. And two, you see, you see banks, you see credit unions, you see insurance. On the insurance side, those uh, life and health insurance, um, medical as well. So again, you're identifying sectors that are immediately impacted. Now this is just from the salaries. This is just government. So now broaden that to the public corporations where we also have concerns about efficiencies and where it is important also to have adjustments. I'm sure the picture looks similar and, and you can extrapolate from that in terms of how it would impact the adjustments and which sectors would be impacted. On a yearly basis, the government gives about $200 million in incentives. These are the amounts of customs and excise taxes that the government could collect under the law, but we, we allow, we, we waive them. Now, if, if we took those away, who would be impacted? I'm sorry, you can't see this uh, too, too well, but the manufacturing sector of our economy um, gets about 12% of those um, concessions. The, the tourism sector, that's in terms of construction as well as operations, get about 25%. Utilities, that includes BEC in terms of the, the, t the tariffs that they're paying on their imports of, of inputs. The agriculture sector gets a lesser amount. But the bottom line is, if you were to reduce these tomorrow, again, we should be looking at how we should manage these long term. But if you reduce these tomorrow, you're also impacting the profitability of countless private sector operations and therefore private sector decisions in terms of the size of their operations and the employment, foreign investment decisions in terms of whether they locate here and whether you see the, the 1,000 new jobs here or there that are created. So that is also important. But it does not um, discount the fact that one needs a framework to look at how the, the level of these uh, concessions are determined, definitely. Now, the other thing is, so if you're spending a third on salaries, then it means that two-thirds of government's recurrent spending is being spent on goods and services, and again, they're being spent in the economy, and therefore that has an impact on the business community, which again goes to the point that a fiscal adjustment on the expenditure side still has very real consequences for, for your economy. What then is the, the government's fiscal consolidation strategy? Well, to grow the revenue uh, by at least 500 million uh, over the next four and a half years. Um, the value added tax is only gonna deliver 200 million. If we don't get that 200 million from the, from the value added tax, the rest that we're gonna get from growth and other improvements in revenue administration will not be sufficient, then you'd be back to looking at how more of that burden can be shared by reduction in government spending. So, so, so this is all a part of a complete puzzle. It is not something that should be viewed in, in isolation. Part of it too, um, maintaining control on government spending. Again, the entire exercise could, could fail if the government spending uh, grows too fast relative to to the revenue improvement. As a matter of fact, the 500 million is, is a good figure because it, it comes very close to, to what the deficit is was last year after you take out the, the, debt, the debt payments. Because we tend to, one of the measures of the debt, the deficit that we look at is one that excludes debt, debt repayment. When you take that out, you're looking at about, about 520 million or thereabouts in, in correction to get this to a balance so that you can begin to see your debt decrease, which is where we, we want to go. Now the question is, do we really have a spending problem in the Bahamas? Look at some examples of the level of spending in some other countries in the region um, relative to the Bahamas. 
and the the red line shows spending, government spending relative to the size of the economy and these other countries. And you see that the Bahamas is not um, leading the pack. But the fact that you have revenues not matching up to expenditure creates a problem irrespective of how much spending you're doing. Um, the debt in the Bahamas is not at the same level as in many of the other countries. Um, the, this, this red bar here is Barbados. This orange, this yellow one here is Jamaica um, in terms of giving you some indication of, of countries that are further along in terms of the, the, the severity of their debt burden and, and giving you an indication of um, where you're drifting if you don't make the corrections. Interest payment, again, relative to other countries, it is not significant. But if you were to compare what Barbados is experiencing to the Bahamas, um, then the, the 200 plus million a year that we're spending in interest would double to about half a billion dollars. Or in the case of Jamaica, we'd be looking at close to a billion dollars a year in interest expenses. So imagine the government spending the same amount of money as, as, as it has today and suddenly having to, to cut or take money from elsewhere because it has to pay this interest on the debt. So these, these, th this is to give you an example of where or how the public finances can spiral out of control if you don't take the corrective action. But, but to also give you a little bit of comfort in knowing that you're not there yet and you have the opportunity to prevent arriving at that point. So value added tax fits into this framework because it's part of the broader reform agenda. Um, it's going to broaden the tax base. It's going to provide for more equitable uh, distribution of the tax burden. And in the short term, it also, I think, spreads the, the burden of the fiscal adjustment out more evenly if you reflect back to the, the businesses that would likely be affected today if you just went and you just slashed government spending and you consider the alternative of, of getting the, the same end consumers, because we pay it in any event, getting the same end consumers to, to try and contribute to that uh, adjustment in a more broader setting. And again, it, it is superior to a sales tax because it has more controls built into it to encourage um, self-compliance and, and, and enforcement. How are we going to secure this in the Bahamas? You, you need a system where the, the value-added tax is optimized in terms of the revenue that it's able to provide to the government. So you need a system where you do not get too preoccupied on providing exemptions for different sectors because as you do that, you diminish the effectiveness in terms of the revenue that we will collect. Um, we talk about exemptions in terms of helping the poor and others who are impacted. The more money that the government has to spend on social programs that directly confront poverty, um, in many cases, that is as good or better. And here we're looking at a system where you can provide more resources so that the government can even provide direct cash transfers to, to poor households so that they can um, be um, sheltered from some of the impact. Of course, in that process, you're not really concerned too much about what happens to myself because it's expected that I should pay uh, a little bit more and contribute to, to this adjustment process. And in this way, I, 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 I try to counter some of the, the negative in terms of whether this is a regressive tax system. We, from the standpoint of businesses, we look at designing from an administrative side uh, that, that encourages compliance. And if you look at research that's been done by KPMG and others, by the US government, uh, some of the scholars, what they tell you is that you want to be simple in terms of the, the, the structure. So when you look at a country like the United Kingdom and you try to draw inferences from the UK about what's going to happen in the Bahamas, they have a very complex system in terms of the different types of rates to value-added tax that apply. We, 
we, we, we, we, we tried to, av to avoid that. We, we're asking businesses to submit electronic returns. The more paperwork that businesses have to do to comply with their monthly obligation, the less incentives they have to comply. You, you're also going to have the one-on-one -on -one dialogue with businesses. Aside from workshops that explain the concept generally, you're going to have the one-on-one -on -one dialogue to make sure that from an operation standpoint, their record-keeping systems are adequate to, to provide the, 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 documented, the document trails for that, and that they also understand and have the confidence that they're doing things correctly. If you fail to do that, Again, it provides an incentive for businesses to care less about compliance and, and reporting. We're setting the, the threshold sufficiently high so that you exempt a lot of smaller businesses from the compliance obligation because the burden of compliance would be greater on smaller business. So you, you remove them from that, from that obligation. You, you also have it so that you have a central revenue agency so you deal with as few government agencies as possible when you're paying your taxes. And again, that helps and reduces the complications. And we're talking about electronic filing as opposed to paper filing. We're, we're also looking at a system where there is a very swift turnaround when it is necessary to provide businesses with credits for, for, that, for, that, that, for, for that that is incurred on their input. So if you're an exporter, I, I believe under the, the framework, since you're always in a credit position, you're almost immediately going to be starting out as an exporter as filing for your credit refunds on a monthly basis. And for most businesses, there, there will be a few months lag before you can make that first approach to the government to obtain a credit, to, to obtain a refund of a credit if it exists. But once you do that, the systems will be such that you can very speedily get those refunds. And if not, the government now has to start paying you interest on the refunds that are due. Again, that is very important in terms of encouraging businesses to be compliant. Um, we, business education is very important, important. We're working with the Institute of Accountants, the Chartered Accountants, to, 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 to put on a workshop for businesses as well as to bring the entire accounting profession up to speed on how they, sh what sort of information they should be providing to businesses because for most of you, you're going to turn to your accountants first for information and, and in terms of understanding what is required of you. Uh, we're also working with chambers of commerce um, throughout the, the islands, and this is happening under the umbrella uh, organization of the Bahamas Chamber of Commerce and the Employers uh, Confederation. The College of the Bahamas is going to be very critical to us in terms of the town hall meetings as well as helping us to organize some of the, the workshop and courses for those who are going to be a part of this, this value-added tax uh, network. And on the consumer side, we, we're also working to, in terms of the planning of our outreach with representatives from the, the trade union who are represented on the advisory committee for the, for the implementation of that. We're also having the outreach to the churches so, so that we can make those presentations to the consumer groups in the intimate um, church uh, setting. Some of that is happening, but it will be ramped up. And we, we understand that in the case of the family island, the, the outreach has to be very planned and organized because we won't have the luxury of doing it every other Thursday or every other Friday. We're going to have to go in and in most cases have a two-day or whatever is required well-structured program so that you can get that message across to, to, to the business community. Now, so in October you will see the, this process um, intensify once the, the legislation is released and also during the month of October um, the, the, the government should be in the position to give the business community the indication of what the, the new customs duty and excise schedule will look like for, for that. Um, we're looking at reductions in customs duties and excise taxes in the 15 to 20 percent range in order to make way for, for that. There may be some exceptions for, for the industries and sectors where the government already has protective tariffs in place 
uh, for, for some industries. So th th those will be respected in terms of preserving the protection, but generally speaking, the 15 to 20 percent range is what we're looking at in terms of what sort of reduction would be needed in customs, duties, and excise taxes. Again, what is most critical is to understand that this is, this is much bigger than just a value-added tax. It is about trying to have the right formula to have the reform in the government finances so that you, you do away with some of the weaknesses and inequalities in the tax system as it stands today. Let me apologize for the speakers who will come after me because I think I went over my time a little bit. Uh, but there will be time for much more in-depth discussion on that. I thank you very much for your attention.